Hello, I'm mischievous Mark Chinacchio, and I own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, Amazing Fantasy number 15, and of course, all of the annuals, which I say do not count, and I can say that right now after two episodes of saying it where it really didn't land as an insult, but now it's an insult again, and so is saying I have Amazing Fantasy 15. Well, not so much of an insult, but more of just kind of like twisting the knife into someone you love. Uh, so I'm going to drop off now because someone else is going to say something. Yeah, well, that someone is me, Dapper Dan Gavostin. And uh, like Mark, I, too, own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, including the annuals, which I love saying count. But even more than loving saying that they count, I'm so happy to be back. And I'm so grateful to both Mark and Available Alan for filling in uh, for me in my absence as I moved across the country. And if I sound different today and maybe slightly echoey, it's because I moved into a new house. Yes, I bought a house, Mark. I am just lining up the life achievements. And uh, I'm in my new attic, which if you're watching the video version, is a big empty room with long boxes in it that will at some point become a spider office of some kind. Uh, but for right now is a big empty space for sound to echo around. And I'm a professional podcaster, but... I literally moved in three days ago, so uh, bear with me here, folks. I apologize for my audio quality. You, what, what you see as a life, like a milestone and a lifetime achievement, I see as just another wasted opportunity to get Amazing Fantasy 15. <laughs> but you know, like yeah, whatever. I got the house first before Amazing Fantasy, so so you got time, Dan. You got time. You know. Like, I appreciate that, Mark. I appreciate that. But uh, again, thank you. Uh, you know, it's rare that I get to like listen to the show as not someone on it. And it's really fun. And I don't know if it's the same experience for everybody else listening, but like I just had a big smile on my face the whole time. Maybe it's because you guys constantly made reference to me, which made it funny. Um, I, I drove across the country with my father and we actually listened to the review of episode or issue 52. And he knows nothing about Spider-Man. Like, but he was really entertained by uh, you guys and thought you were really smart and I agree. So uh, it was a lot of fun to kind of be on the outside for a little bit, but I am very excited about being back. Well, what we, uh, of course, what Dan is back from is the Amazing Spider Talk, the show where two fans and collectors uncover the strange, fun, and fascinating history of the Spider-Man comic universe. And thank you, of course, for joining us for this review episode of the Amazing Spider Talk. Yeah, if you want to swing along with us on our journey through Spidey's past, present, and future, subscribe to Amazing Spider Talk on your favorite podcast app and leave us a review to help spread the word about our show. I did want to add a special note here, too, and I, I communicated this to Mark because it's something I just learned, which is Apple Podcasts has changed the way that the episodes download in their app. So if you are an Apple Podcast subscriber and you don't listen to three episodes of this show in a row, it will stop automatically downloading the latest episodes of the show. So just let this be a reminder that, like, if you're listening to this and you skip them here and there, Mark and I are always producing this stuff. Honestly, I think it's a safer bet now to subscribe through uh, Spotify or another podcast app. I know Apple Podcast is the biggest of all of the apps, and most of our listeners listen there. But they've been making some behind the scene changes that uh, I don't really love. And, you know, uh, I've noticed a lot of drop off from listeners because of those changes. So we want you to keep listening on your own timeline and keeping up with the show. And so I just wanted to remind everybody of the kind of behind the scenes of podcast distribution. This podcast was brought to you by Apple Computers. Uh, this podcast <laughs> also exists because of the support of our Patreon members. If you want to receive early episodes, exclusive artwork, and keep this podcast going, go to AmazingSpiderTalk.com and consider joining our Patreon. Yeah, well, obviously, Mark, the best way to subscribe to the podcast is on the Patreon, where everybody gets the show two or three weeks ahead of time for every episode. So, you know, if you really don't want to worry about this, that's the way to do it. 
But in the meantime, today on the show, Mark and I are going to be discussing Amazing Spider-Man Volume 6, Number 54. This issue is written by Zeb Wells. The cover features artwork by Ed McGuinness and Marcio Menez. The interior pages feature pencils by Ed McGuinness, inks by Mark Farmer, Mark Morales, Wade Von Grybadger, and Ed McGuinness. Four inkers in, in this comic. I, I, I'll say it right now. I did not notice. I actually thought no. this was pretty seamless. Uh, yeah. The colors were by Marcio Menez, and of course, letters by the one man band. He's on bass, he's on drums, he's on electric guitar, and he's doing the <laughs> vocals. It's VC's Joe Caramagna. This issue was first released on July 31st, 2024. All right, Mark. Well, uh, let's get back to it. I mean, I am happy to be returning to the show to kind of cap off this story, and I, I, I'm going to sound beyond me sounding echoey because of the room I'm in, I'm going to sound like an echo of myself from several weeks ago, or I guess months ago now, which is to say, let's talk about the rules uh, uh, of all of this. And I know that I can be very like persnickety and I'm sure Alan had some adjective to describe me about like how in the details and weeds that I can get, but that's where this comic ends. This story ends being like, obsessive about how these MacGuffins work. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I don't think it's terribly clear. And I know that it's definitely not narratively satisfying or emotionally compelling. It's just kind of like a who can figure out rock, paper, scissors as a way of ending this Norman fight. How do you feel about the rules? You've mocked me in the past for being obsessed about this. Was it worth the time talking about all this? Well, I, I, I don't want to say I, I never turned out an opportunity to mock you, Dan. I want to put that first and foremost. Fair but, enough. Uh, but I will admit after uh, two review episodes where, um, you know, I started to bring up some of these things like, how does this work anyway? And Alan was like, oops, I don't care. I was kind of like, huh. Maybe I do need Dan's obsessive personality to kind of weigh in here. Cause this <laughs> no one is... <laughs> has ever wished for that. Well, you know, no, no one has ever hosted a Spider-Man podcast with you, Dan, that I know of. Um, <laughs> so um, I guess that's where we're at. I mean, look, like, do I do I need to know, like, every lurid, intimate detail of these things? Not necessarily. But, like, the fact of the matter is I think even at a high, broad level – it is immaculately unclear how this all is supposed to work. And I feel like it just kind of shifts and moves around um, from issue to issue um, out of convenience. And I think it, 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 it does the story a, a disservice in the end for doing it that way, because, you know, like uh, what, what we essentially got in this issue was a, a fight in a bunker between, you know, Spider-Man and the Green Goblin, mortal enemies who've had many fantastic, memorable fights, some to the death, uh, if you consider, you know, getting impaled by a glider and then disappearing for 20 years of death. Um, and they were fighting in a bunker over a, a pink goblin ethereal spirit being coming and going from their bodies. And I'm just like, what has happened here? Like, this is not, this has never been anything having to do with the the blood vendetta between these two characters and 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 like you know i i just don't know what we're supposed to do with this i mean you know this goes all the way back to nick spencer having the sin eater shoot norman with a gun that kind of opened this pandora's box you know i think we were kind of impressed dare i say over the fact that Zeb Wells was choosing to acknowledge that part of the Ze of the Nick Spencer run since so much of the Nick Spencer run was not acknowledged over the last couple of years. But like at the end of the day, I don't know if this is exactly what Nick had in mind either for how we were going to play things out with Peter and Norman. So, uh, yeah, like let's let's bring it on. Br get your conspiracy board, Dad. Do you want to like explain what you understand or how do you want to do this? <laughs> I mean, I think I understand it in like practice, you know, but like it's inconsistent and it's it's focus is on all the wrong things like th this is a MacGuffin. And I think you put it really well in your recap, uh, like a, an issue ago where you said like Spider-Man takes the two MacGuffins and combines them into a super MacGuffin. Right. 
And the point of a MacGuffin isn't to be like the most interesting thing, right? Like it can be a Maltese Falcon, you know, like in the case of Indiana Jones, it's the Ark of the Covenant, but like, it still is mostly just a giant paperweight that the characters have to chase after. It only really gets interesting in the last three minutes. You know, it is it is the the item that is going to compel the characters to make character based choices in relationship to chasing after the thing, stopping the thing, whatever it is. Um, and I won't say that this issue is completely free of character choices. Uh, like Norman chooses to stab himself with the spear at some point or to absorb the sins back into him. And so he at least gets a choice. I don't believe that it's a terribly compelling uh, narrative choice, but he does. Spider-Man has made a choice off panel to come up with a scheme that we don't know about. And so we are not allowed any insight into the choice that he has made. And so instead, the book is focusing on, and I'll bring back a classic from our, our catalog, is the secret scrolls of it all. You know, it's like nobody in Spider-Verse cared about the uh, the secret scrolls. And frankly, to Dan Slott's credit, we don't really know what the scrolls said. They were just a thing people were chasing after. A right. silly thing, but it was still character oriented, even if I don't feel like he landed the plane on that story. Here, I just think, like, this is all a distraction and none of it really makes all that much sense. Like, the minute, like, that, uh, you know, Peter gets the, or the sins get freed from the spear, they go back to Norman. And then a second later, they're like, we don't want to be in Norman, we want to be in Peter. And it's like, couldn't you have just gone into Peter? And really, we're just, we're on a merry-go-round here. We're just doing the same beats over and over again. Peter's possessed. Norman's possessed. Peter's possessed. Norman's possessed. Get to the freaking point. Right. Like, or, or do something with it. Get to character and tell us, like, what they're fighting over and how they feel about it. I mean, there, there's... You could mine it for anything. Like, Peter feels it's his responsibility to save other people, but Norman feels his goblin sins are his responsibility. Like they could out try to out noble each other. I mean, there's so much you could do with this and I don't think it chooses any of it. Yeah, no, I, 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 I can't push back on, on any of that. And, and, you know, I, I think where I say it's confusing is because like, I, I maybe confusing is not exactly the word, but it's like, as you said, because of the inconsistency of how this is all being written, I, I just feel like the rules are highly malleable and, and that creates uh, clunky storytelling that, that can be difficult to follow because it's like, OK, we have the spear and they're in the spear, but then there's the Winkler device and, you know, we can we can we can disable the spear but then the winkler device starts to inter intersect and it's like okay so where does this end you know what i mean like what 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 supersedes what like you know how 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 um you know i it still seems like the resolution was just peter was going to rise above it through spirit and willpower which i guess is fine but like I don't know, then what's the point of all these other things happening? Like, why didn't he just do that in the first place? I, I, I you know, like, I, I, I don't fully grasp what, like you said, like, what are we, what are we trying to say here? You know, I, I, I feel like every time we kind of reach one of these points with this, this book, um, you know, one of us or both of us ask this question kind of rhetorically, which is, what are they trying to say here? And I don't know. What are they trying to say here? I mean, there, you know, we, we, we get some beats about Peter and, you know, his his ability to learn and to do, do, do right where there was once wrong. And, you know, that's all well and good. But, like, that's also something we've gotten many times before. And I don't know what's new about that. Like, what's what's the new wrinkle here? What do we what's what's the new part of the mythos here? Are we just regurgitating old stories? I, I, I don't know. Um, what, wh what do you think about that, Dan? I'm, I mean, I think that's exactly right. You know, like I, I Spider-Man will inevitably return to the whole like idea that Peter's goodness or his light, as they put it in this is so great 
because of the darkness he's faced or his ability to get knocked down and get back up again. It is an overused trope um, in, in the Spider-Man comics. And I'm not going to begrudge any author going leaning into it because it is a backbone of Spider-Man stories. It's the like get knocked down, get back up again, you know, bad things happen. But the way that it's been used over the past 10 years and perhaps longer than that is it's an overused trope to end narratives without investing in the current narrative. Instead, it just leans on this spread of past stories to do all the heavy lifting for what's supposed to be happening in this story. You know, the, the, the great counter to this is like something like coming home, which I know is unfair. It's your and my like favorite Spider-Man story of all time. But what makes that story great is it doesn't, it doesn't feel the need to lean on past stuff. It establishes its own rhythm, its own thematic idea about purity and whether he's a character of science or of, of destiny. And so I'm not pure is a, is a same distillation of the, like I'm, I'm, I'm fallen down and I get back up again and I can get up and punch Moreland, but it's unique to that individual story and its yeah. ideas uh, and and the story put in the work for that. And here it's just like, as beautiful as I thought that spread was, it's a cheat. It, it's completely a cheat. Yeah. What I what I was going to actually say before you made that point, Dan, was was you know along the the same lines, which is that the difference between what's happening now in these comics versus like a story like Coming Home and what have you is like the the the, the moments being mined for today's comics or to, or this comic specifically were all of like that when I what I said earlier like what are we trying to say uh, this time around what's the wrinkle to the Peter overcomes the odds and you know rises above it kind of trope if you will and those stories are the unique wrinkles and you know over the last 10 years or so when we've repeated that beat what I you know I don't think any of us 10 years from now are going to look back on those stories and be like, and quote those, that story, like this story is not going to be quoted 10 years from now, but we're still going to be quoting Peter crawling out of the grave uh, in Craven's last hunt, or obviously uncle Ben, or obviously Gwen Stacy's death or, or coming home or the juggernaut. Like the, these are all stories that, like you said, did the work to actually create a moment in that is now like frozen in amber, if you will, as to kind of persevere, you know, show this perseverance and, and preserve it for all time. And this these comics are just kind of like, no, 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 we're going to just play the hits. Um, it, you know, it's it's like going to a Billy Joel concert in 2024. You're not getting anything new anymore. And and that's disappointing. Uh, you know, I would, <laughs> I would much rather see. You know, how is Zeb Wells going to interpret this rather than I'm just going to leverage these other old moments to push the story forward? Yeah, and it is an interesting moment to, like, see what is included in that thread as a way of, like, saying, like, what do these, you know, people like, like, how do they self mythologize? You know, it's like a mythology commenting on a mythology. And I thought it was interesting that, like, um, like the most modern or really the only story from like the Nick Lowe tenure or even the Steve Wacker tenure that's referenced is um, the red goblin Mm storyline, which mm -hmm. like fair enough. I thought that was an excellent, you know, finale to the Dan slot um, story. Um, I was kind of like weirded out to see one more day (laughs) included in there because it suggests that the, the living brain who is narrating this, knows about one the events of one more day which peter doesn't even know about right. like unless my understanding is wrong that never happened um uh a lot of the other events happened but specifically peter making a deal with the devil is not something that anyone remembers and so i i don't know i this is my bing nerdy nitpick like uh one more day should not be included there um, although I'm sure some people on the internet had a field day with that one. Sure. Um, so yeah, um, you know, in reading this, uh, you know, to, to kind of double down on your other, your point, like, and your Instagram actually helped me with this is like, all I could think about is the better stories that have done this almost exact same thing before. 
e- not even necessarily with the Goblin, but like I think about something even like Amazing Spider-Man three seventeen, the Return of Venom, right? Where it's you know Peter and Venom standing or Eddie standing on a beach, and the symbiote can't decide who it wants to go with, and Peter exploits that in order to you know defeat Eddie, and the mechanics of that are very clear in a way that they're not here. Um, but you mentioned a story, I think, The Revenge of the Green Goblin in your Instagram, mm-hmm. that is almost exactly this story, Yeah. Um, but is very character-based. Do you want to talk about that? Oh, sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I wasn't. I, I didn't know this was going to be on the quiz, Mr. Gavazdin, but no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, Re- Re- Revenge of the Green Goblin, I mean, that was both, that was Paul Jenkins, Howard Mackey wrote some of that, I think even Roger Stern, like that was, that was a crossover story, and yet it was very consistent. It was, it, I mean, I, I kind of feel it's like the original of the Norman Osborn wants to make Peter the heir. Uh, to yeah. his to his legacy kind of storyline, um, you know, before it became that that became a trope, uh, because this was also Norman kind of fresh on returning from the dead uh, at the end of the Clone Saga, and this was one of the really first major uh, interactions. And you know, basically, in the in the issue that Dan is referring to, that was on my Instagram feed recently. Um, you know, Peter and, and Norman, you know, Norman has Peter captured and they, they basically kind of slug it out over the fact that Peter is not going to succumb to Norman's torture to, to get him to, you know, basically buy in and be his, his, you know, the heir to the throne, if you will. And like, yeah, we get that a lot, uh, in this story too. I mean, to the point, like, well, that's the thing too, that I, I guess, um, and I, I, I didn't necessarily call this out in the recap, but like something else that I was kind of having a hard time wrapping my head around in this issue, which is this, this whole subplot of uh, Norman is going to sign everything over to uh, Peter, like all the subsidiaries of Oscorp. And, you know, it, it, it felt to me in the lead up to this issue that this was something that Norman was very pro and Peter was very against like, why, you know, what, what, what is this about? You know? And, and like, and, it felt like that got flip flopped in this issue where like, you know, Peter once under the influence of the sins was like, and now you're going to give everything to me. Wahaha. And Norman's like, no, you can't. Yeah. I like, it, it was just very odd to me that this was the dynamic that they chose to exploit. And I guess it came down to who had the sins and who didn't, but yet it, it's just another example of, I feel like the inconsistency of the storytelling here and trying to point that forward. I, I, I still don't understand what the end game and that was like so if peter is the heir apparent is there anything more than just like i said recycling this revenge of the green goblin story that we i just talked about or was there more to it i don't know did we ever get anything else out of that i i think the idea is that like uh the mistake that uh, the goblin spirit like or the sins whatever like suggests that the mistake norman made was um allowing Peter to get the sins in him because once the sins went into Peter and that, and the goblin persona went into Peter, it was like, this is a way better vessel for me to occupy. So it is trying to get back and take over Peter. And part of that is using its time in Norman's body to sign everything over to Peter. So its goal was to eliminate Norman, kill Norman and exist as Peter Parker um, the goblin spider goblin with the Oscorp enterprise all signed over to his name. So it was really just a way of discarding Norman Osborn, uh, uh, altogether. Um, you know, which I think has like interesting, you know, uh, potential there that is really unexplored, um, um, in this story. And, you know, it even got me circling back to like, we don't know how the sins got back to Norman in the first place, mm. right? They bury the spear, and then at the same issue, they bury the spear. P- Norman has that little like laugh under his breath. And I think you and I talked at the time like, did they just float out of the spear back to Norman? Yeah. And the first issue of this storyline, Norman kind of implies that like, he got the sins and reabsorbed them because he felt it was his responsibility. How that worked, I don't know. Did he stab himself with the spear again? Uh, To me, it's like not showing that or not explaining what that is undermines so much of Norman's character. Like 
if he truly felt like, look, the spear is out there. No one else should have to bear this, whether they dig it up or not. I need to take it in and, I don't know, kill myself like he almost does in a death in the family, you know, or at least it's implied there. Uh, you know, that's a really interesting character beat. And you can understand the flawed thinking behind that. Uh, but it's le- it's left ambiguous at, probably because he didn't want to explain the mechanics of this story. Um, but I mentioned death in the family, and, and I'm going to use this to segue into the, uh, some, the next topic, which is, to me, death in the family. And if you haven't read that, I know you have, Mark, but listeners, if you haven't read it, that's from Peter Parker, Spider-Man, number 44 to 47. It's a Paul Jenkins story. Humberto Ramos on... On pencils, very early Humberto Ramos yeah. when he was a very different stylistically, much looser. Um, to me, is the exact opposite of the story. Like, if you could get the exact opposite of the story, it's that because that story has no strong hook to it. Like, you, the way you would describe that story is just like it's Peter Parker versus the Goblin, and that's kind of it. And yet it's, it's all focused on the characters. It's all about these two guys airing their grievances for each other in, in a way that actually weirdly brings them together by the end of the story. Um, and it's so character-based, whereas this is all uh, high-level concept and very little characterization. And to me, that's what really falls apart. Like, if you're telling me this is the end of the Green Goblin the end of this 60 plus year rivalry. And there's really very little drama about who these people are to each other. What, what do you, what do you think about all that? Do you buy this? I mean, obviously the goblin's going to be back, but do I buy that? That's what they're trying to convey here. Yes. Yeah. Um, the final page says the end, like right, a bold, right, full page. Right. No, I see. That's the thing. Like, it, it's it's hard to separate what I expect to happen versus what I think they're trying to communicate. But like, if I'm being completely um, unbiased about it, then yeah, I think that's what they're trying to communicate. I I don't buy it for a second. Um, you know, like we've seen every iteration of this is really the end for Norman. Now, I mean, you know, from prison to he lost his memories to he died to you know whatever um so um you know never say never in comics um but yeah it 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 it, it was such a strange ending um which you know i know that wasn't necessarily the answer you were looking for but like yeah you know it both was trying to convey that but like then it also it also felt like this finality to the peter and norman story of not the last 60 years but the last 50 something issues you know and like it's just like okay well you know this was the line that was crossed for peter and you know he doesn't hate norman for it necessarily but he's certainly not going to be friends with him anymore and it's just kind of like not that i expected them to like you know walk off hand in hand here but like it 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 just felt like again because nothing was truly earned in this story like it 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 felt very perfunctory and 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 telling not showing because it was just like what was the actual personal struggle here you know like like is peter even being reflective about this choice he now has to make like which is like you know norman i can't be near you anymore you know because i can't trust you like it's not it's not apparent in any way um so like you know not only did we get the end of the green goblin so so we think but like the end of peter and norman and i think both were kind of executed with the same lack of depth that i would have preferred uh for a moment of that magnitude given both you know where we've been historically with these characters and then where we've been in recent history with these characters so many and uh, uh, great goblin stories are not just about Peter and Norman. Like they're also about the people that kind of like suffer in the wake of this feud. You know, like whether it be 
Norman, you know, like losing his memory and everybody kind of like accepting him back into their life, but knowing Peter, knowing that there's a time bomb about to go off and will he subject his friends to that or like the impact that it has on Harry Osborn, you know, and we just got through a whole run. I say just, but I guess it was three years ago uh, where it ended with Harry Osborn dying, you know, to me, this kind of strikes me, and I know it's not the first Goblin story without the extended family. There's, like, revelations and, like, things like that. But, like, um, like so many – all the Goblin stories are really not just about, like, a momentary battle. They're about the – they're always about the whole history of – he's known him since he was 15. His best friend is Harry Osborn. Like, do you think that, like, this character just – this villain doesn't really work anymore without Harry Osborn as a character in the picture. I, I, I don't know if I'm willing to go that far. I think the, the family connections and, you know, it's, it's funny because <laughs> one, one of the many, in my mind, unfulfilled promises of the Nick Spencer run, if you remember, was like all this teasing out of, it wasn't just about, Harry, but like, you know, we were getting these flashbacks with MJ and Flash and Gwen and kind of like, you know, this end, you know, this end of innocence of this era from, you know, the rise of Norman. And and, and I don't feel like that story paid that off at all. Uh, but at the same time, I think the um, the insinuation and the promise of it was very interesting at the time, because I like I like you said, like, it, you know, one of the key elements of this relationship is not just Peter versus Norman, but it's 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 Peter versus Norman and Harry and Peter versus Norman and how Peter relates to his parents and his and his aunt and uncle. And it's their friends and destroying the innocence of Gwen and, you know, what that did to Peter and MJ and MJ. And, you know, like it, it's a whole cascading effect of all of the supporting cast. So like, I don't know if um, it's necessarily about Harry per se, but I do think like the story is enriched when you can explore the dynamics of the supporting cast in a, in a meaningful way, which of course in this comic, the supporting cast was Kamala Khan and Jonah in octopus arms and wreck rap like none of this none of these characters mattered in the in the grand scheme of things f for this relationship uh and I think the story suffered as a result does that make sense yeah yeah I I just think it's like been reduced ad absurdum it's like we like the whole thing ends on um you know can we or like you know exercise a pink ghost rather than like, did the characters make any lasting change or impact on each other? Yep. Um, and, and that's just really disappointing. All right, we're going to get back to our review in a second. Mark, why don't you tell us about our Slack? Hundreds of listeners like you hang out in our community of Spider-Man fans on Slack. The amazing Spider-Slack community is absolutely free to join. And you can jump into active conversations with awesome people about collecting, conventions, movies, new comics, old comics, and more. Dan, what's been going on in the Slack this week? Actually, Mark, I need our listeners' help in the Slack this mm. week. You know, you're, if you're watching online and you're seeing the video of this or you're hearing my echo, I'm in a big empty attic. Like I said, and behind me is this big pile of long boxes, which is like half of my collection. And I'm tired of having them in long boxes. Uh, I know that like some people have like custom built furniture, you know, just to store their comics. I want something that I can reach in and find the things that I'm looking for. And I could use your help if you have a cool way that you catalog and store like 4000 comics come into our uh, collection channel and share it with us. People have already been giving me some ideas and they're really exciting, but like I I'm finally reconnected with my full collection after all these years and I'm eager to play with it. So uh, Mark, how do you store your comics? 
I store them in boxes, Dan. <laughs> I, I, I have been um, allocated a closet in our house, and my collection must fit within that closet. And the only way to fit it in that closet is to stack it in boxes. So that is, that is where I, uh, you know, if, if the collection exceeds the parameters of the closet, I have to find new hobbies, Dan. So, uh, there you go. So, uh, you know, uh, don't tell my wife that. And thankfully she doesn't listen to the show. Um, and, uh, come tell me the largest format that I can store these comics imaginable. There That's really what I'm looking for. Yeah. So come join in the fun. Come join our amazing Slack. There's a link in the description of this episode that'll let you sign up in less than a minute. And uh, we'd love to see you there. All right, Mark, getting back to Amazing Spider-Man Volume 6, number 54. My, like, biggest... We haven't really talked about all the other stuff that was happening in this comic. Uh... You know, I think you said it after the end of like the first or second issue in the story, which you were like, this seems like there's way too much going on to conclude in five issues. And I think I pushed back being like, I don't know, this doesn't seem like too much hmm. stuff for five issues. But then it just kept growing in my absence. More characters started getting added to this roster. And it really felt like uh, this was, you know, the whole like put the toys away kind of storyline. But then we get to this issue, which I also think is overstuffed. And I don't really know that any of the toys got put away. They just kind of got forgotten. Well, the toys, the toys were kind of put on display, but like, you know, but yeah, I don't know if they were, if they were put away, but they weren't played with either. It was just kind of like, Hey, look, I got toys. Remember these toys? I have them. They're still here. Uh, all right got to go. Bye. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? Like I, 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 you know, I don't know if it was more to it than that, but yeah, it it seemed like we were, we were setting up to pay off many, many, many things from the, not even just the beginning of this Zeb well solo run, but like even going to the beyond run with chasm, um, and, and the Winkler device, a, uh, but, um, instead it was just kind of, you know, not paid off. It was just kind of, Played out, but not played off. I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the right analogy here. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's fine in Spider-Man comics or comics in general for e elements for other stories to drift in and out of a story. Mm -hmm. But, like, there's so many elements here that I don't even know what they contributed. You know, like Craven, for example. Like, not only is he included in this story, but he gets his own, like, you know, monologue boxes in the style of Craven's Last Hunt. And maybe that's just a stylish thing, but like, really, what did he add to this story other than saying like, this is important. And he literally, I reread the whole story today because I was bored and he's like, I have to like, you know, get there because I'm marching towards my fate. His fate was to be knocked out off panel by Kam Kamala Khan. Like, why like where was the editor to tell him we can trim this we can trim this yeah. like so much of this felt that way i mean even the sinister six which was fun at the beginning of this story it's like did this need to be a part of this story other than to pad it out and give a reason for like the uh, de the debut of a spider goblin costume i mean i get it issue yeah. 50 needed to sell some comics but like yeah, but think think of all the work they did with like Sandman, like in the lead up to this story, as part of like the getting the Sinister Six back together, and like that wasn't paid off yeah. in any kind of real way. You know what I mean? Like it was just the payoff was just like we're using these guys now. It's like okay, if you must. <laughs> yeah, uh, like, and and Rec Rap is there for a few jokes, like I guess. I mean, I, and early on in the story, I even posed like, hey. Like maybe Chasm will be the hero of the story. And I know you guys joked about Poochie and the Chasm died on the way back to his planet, but like literally where did he go? Yeah, like yeah. he was a part of this story and the Winkler device and all of that. And then he was just like, peace. And I mean, we didn't yeah. see him again. Yeah. And, and, and since you brought him up, I mean, like I'm not trying to pile on here, but even like rec rap and the jokes felt very uninspired in this comic. I mean, like, yeah, we, we've been joking since Rec Rap first appeared, you know, famously, 
Rec Rap is great, but I never have to see him again. And then he came back and it was like, you know what? No, he's kind of great. You know, like I, I, I'm enjoying this. And it was just so perfunctory here uh, in these issues. And like even this whole like, hey, how does it feel surviving a glider to your heart? I don't know. And it was like, I wasn't like really laughing at it. It was just like, okay, like we're going to play up like that wacky Rec Rap. But like there was no, no meat on the bones. It was just kind of like. Tell a rec rap joke. Okay, go to the next page. Okay, now do this. Now let's work in Kamala. Okay, now got to go back to the the goblin fight. It it, it was very um, without any kind of flow or or um, dare I say heart and soul. It was just kind of like there, you know, like on the page. Yeah, and we've gotten used to ends of arcs being sloppy, but like this one also felt like it lost its conviction. And yes. we've talked a lot about like the kind of failures of the the end of the goblin, but like this felt like a story that like one advertised itself as like someone's gonna die and there's gonna be really big consequences from this. And in the end, you know, I don't really think anything changed out of this story. I mean, the goblin was hinting at transferring all of Oscorp to Peter, which could have been a cool direction to take the story and have Peter running Oscorp. Like, I mean, yeah. first of all, the internet would have gotten all up in its feelings, <laughs> but like that might've been neat, but nope. Like it doesn't matter anymore. Like Norman is fine. He's right back to where he was at the start of this run, except dramatically less interesting because the goblin is dead. So like, there's not even the threat of Norman becoming the goblin again, although I refuse to believe that this creative uh, editorial office won't have a 50th issue of Amazing Spider-Man that is a goblin story. So I'll believe it when I see it. Right. Um, but yeah, were there any like other things that you were like, man, that was really unresolved or like I was hoping for it to go somewhere uh, and maybe impact the overall status quo? I mean, <sighs> I don't know if I was like hoping for it to impact the the status quo, but like I still don't truly get what the big deal was with like the living brains role in all this. Like, I mean, it kind of just served as a narrator, uh, as a as a narrator. But like, I don't know. Like, w w was there more to it there that I'm just not seeing? Um, you know, we're well, it, it serves the function as like a helmet to like trap Spider-Man in. But like that could have just been the Winkler device. Like if you're going to clean up the story, that's how right. you clean it up is you you combine stuff that you know doesn't need to be multiple different characters. You know, right. um, that's a kind of screenwriting 101 is. You know, like if if two characters can be one character, it should be one character. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I can't help but reflect on this, too, that at the end of this, like Norman, another person that knows Spider-Man's identity is made into a good character now on ostensibly on Spider-Man's team, like for good, it, right. or, you know, as for good in comics as it can be. But, like, it adds to this growing roster of characters that, like, don't really have anything to do now. Yeah. Like, Jameson, what are we doing with this character? Like, it, cool for one story that he knows Spider-Man's identity, but ever since then, they don't know what to do with him. And this is an increasing trend with the cast of this book. And it wouldn't be a problem if I felt like this book could go, okay, Let's leave Jameson and Norman aside. Their stories are done. But this is a book that is obsessed with old characters. And so I just feel like it's going to trot these guys out with no idea of what to do with them. Instead of, I mean, give Slot the credit. You know, he invented new cast members to be a part of the story or the brand new day team who created new villains. Like, that maybe is what this book needs if it's not if it's going to keep eliminating all these characters from the rich dramatic potential they once had. Well, Kindred was a new character. <laughs> uh, fair enough. Fair enough. It was he though because yeah, he ended up being Gabriel true, and true, Sarah true, Stacey. True, yeah. True, true. Um, you want to talk a little bit about uh, 
Steady Eddie McGinnis here. Yeah, it feels unfair to like talk about this book in this way when Ed McGinnis is doing the work that he's doing. Yeah. Uh, uh, on this book, which is maybe the like tagline for every Amazing Spider-Man comic for the past ten years, which is like, uh, but you know, besides the writing, Mister Lincoln, how was the artwork? Right. You know? right, uh, right. Yeah. yeah. Whether it's Ryan Otley or Patrick Gleason, and you know, welcome to the club, Ed McGinnis, because like, yeah, he was. He was a superstar uh, through this whole arc. I mean, I started saying a few issues in, like, you know, when they were splitting duties with Todd Nock. And, you know, and I know we've had our conversations about Todd Nock, both <laughs> online and offline. And, 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 and I, I thought he was totally serviceable totally. In, what he, in what he did in this arc. But, like, McGinnis's art was so head and shoulders above his. Like, it was, like, kind of disappointing to me. Like, I was just like, why can't we just get an entire – comic of mcginnis and we got that here granted with four different anchors but like I, I as you noted in the intro i i couldn't tell the difference between oh here's grab Badger's inks oh here's uh you know morales's inks you know what i mean like it was um pretty seamlessly done and and i feel like mcginnis uh completely rose to the occasion here like if this is his swan song on his on this run which seems to be the case um this was a phenomenal issue. Like, I mean, as, as well illustrated an issue as we've gotten on this comic um, in quite some time. Yeah, I thought the double page spreads, as much as narratively I bashed them, were visually stunning. The, the you know, obviously the recreation of, uh, of Spider-Man's history is like the kind of artwork you wish you could afford putting on your wall. <laughs> sure. Um, someone's going to get it out there. And I, I wish I was that someone, uh, even like Peter bursting, like a, you know, an, an alien out of the goblins head, uh, was a really incredible looking page, um, as intangible as I find that sequence. Mm. Um, I, and I love his interpretation of the swirling heads of guilt combined <laughs> with the goblin there. Like, I, I love that Gwen was referenced in there. You know, it adds to the narrative, you know, ever so slightly that, like, it is kind of like Peter being attacked by the floating heads of guilds. Yeah. I, I found most of the other characters outside of Gwen fairly indistinguishable, but um, it was still a creepy creation. And I thought there was some really solid acting. Like, there's a moment early on where Norman is kind of, like, pinned weakly against the wall, and he says, like, I hate you. And... Peter is like up, you know, with with the goblin sins and he's like stretching his body like it's like a new, you know, thing he's about to go exercise. And I thought that added so much character. So, I mean, he did such a great job on an issue like this. Um, yeah, you just you wish it was in service of something a bit stronger because yeah. they've got the best artists in comics working on this. So, yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> Sigh. Do you want to give this a grade, uh, Master Dan? Yeah. You know, I'm probably going higher than I um, my tone is suggested. Mm -hmm. I think this is a C minus comic. Uh, like, I think it's below average, but it's got strong art. You know, it, it's a, it, it makes sense. Like, this is not Kindred. You know, this is no. not the conclusion to that. It is a fairly like f n like average, boring comic. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm tempted to give the same grade as you, but I'm I'm you know I guess true to brand, I'm gonna just be a a, a, a little notch below. Uh, I can give it a D plus. Um, say, you know, basically the same rationale. I just like I I. I do feel that, um, yeah, this was just not a well-reasoned storyline. Uh, I, I don't know if well-reasoned is what I should be asking for in comics, but like, yeah. I, I, at the same time, I don't, I, you know, I, I, I feel like w when you said lacked conviction a few minutes ago, I really do think that's um, the best way to summarize what what we've witnessed here, which is, you know, it. it it's not it, it's not kindred um we're not like trying to just kind of you know and end the storyline and try, you know 
a thousand issues early or whatever it ended up being and 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 you know trying to make it work um you know i i do feel like this the zeb wells run is coming to an organic end it doesn't feel like it's being cut short but at the same time like i i i am not getting the sense that i think i think we'll see some more conviction in the next story because zeb zeb seems to routinely kind of come home when tombstone's involved um but um yeah, I, I, I don't know if he truly had his heart in resolving this Norman story, and it showed. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, and my my looking back on this, I will pro- probably regard it lower than I'm currently expressing. But, right. um, Mark, let's let's end this show uh, on a high note, shall <laughs> let's we? Let's end it. Let's get out of here. No, it's, <laughs> it's that time. Time for all good things to come to an end. So we want to say thank you to you, the listeners, and, of course, our viewers who are watching Dan in his empty attic uh, with his echoes and tuning into this episode of The Amazing Spider Talk. Yeah, this podcast exists because of listener support on Patreon. For only $3.99 a month, you can help support our show's existence while getting early episodes, including these reviews, the same week the comics release, exclusive artwork, and a ton of other bonuses. So a thank you to everybody who already supports us and the work that we do. Plus, we wanted to extend a special thanks to our newest contributor, Alex. Dan and I really want to increase all the awesome work we do in the second half of 2024. So if you're already a patron or want to become one, please help us to meet our goals and make this a better podcast by considering supporting our show. Just go to AmazingSpiderTalk.com and click on the big old Patreon button to get started. So Mark, until you and I enter a volley where we pass the sins of the annuals between us, what's our motto? Here, this is where I flip back on the table and go, with great podcasts there must also come the amazing spider talk you really liked alien i loved it man that was so good how have i not you're, seen you're that like, <laughs> you're like peter parker in uh, infinity war right yeah now. i saw this really old movie and opened the hatch and <laughs> <Yeah. made that> <laughs> there you go